This is the January slash February anime of 2024. This one is a little weird because before um, I stay, stated specifically in the December anime that I was going to do a December anime. Um, actually, I wasn't going to do a January anime. Um, come February, wasn't able to do that either. So both January and February seem to have been a miss. I, there's no seem to about it. Um, I didn't intend to do a January one, but the February one kind of got delayed simply due to the fact that there was a lot of terrible animes released in January and in uh, also in early February. Um, I believe it's by mid-February. That's when stuff started to get real good. And some animes were good in late January as well. So the anime I missed in late January and the anime for mid-February going to the end of February is going to be logged here. And I'm going to make sure I terminate all the bad ones, or should I say I made sure I terminate the, the bad ones. Um, so if any of the anime on this list are considered bad to you, then that means the ones that not on this list were even worse. Uh, I consider factors with regards to story. I consider factors with regards to characters. I consider factors with regards to um, uh, environment. I consider factors with regards to pacing. I consider factors with regards to execution uh, and exposition and foreshadowing and um, uh, character traits and uh, beginning, middle, and end, as well as a hook and plots and plots within plots and motivations as well as um, the type of anime it is as a total. Um, did the author, or in this case, did the animator and the, the writer got the story executed correctly with regards to the anime that they did. And since most anime nowadays are based on a manga, did they execute it accurately? And if it's not based on a manga, um, did they execute their vision accurately? So, uh, my name is Maggie. I do anime, I do games, I do um, uh, mangas, uh, manwas, and manua. And every now and again, um, uh, I would do a manga and video with manga, but those things are like uh, three times within a year, uh, three or four times within a year. But mangas st typically t are, are the same every month, or if not every other month. Since January was extremely busy, this is the anime for 2024 of uh, late January and mid February, going to the end of February. In other words, if anime hasn't been released yet in February, at the late February, the last week of February, or even the second week of February, um, it's still not posted yet because of embargo and other issues. Maybe the country decided that they didn't want to release it in uh, foreign countries. Whatever the reasons are, if they're not present, then it means a lot of streaming services now also don't have it present um, because I can't find it online or cultural and so on and so forth. Um, if it's sold in a store, then it's simply due to uh, shipping and receiving. I would have to buy it from the store. But most of my stuff is straight through streaming services. Um, so this first one is called Meiji Gekin, 1874. And it's about the Boshin Wars. Now, there's a little education to this one. That's why I picked this one. And it's pretty damn good. It's a 7.76 or 7.79 um, as a total with regards to how people view this. Um, what is uh, IMBD or whatever. Um, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, why? I watch every single episode. I'm pretty sure that they've watched it as well. They're probably asking, what are the motivations? What are the characters? Where is the character in the story? Is the character going up, going down? Is there not a character in the story? There is a character in the story. The main protagonist of this story is called Shizuma Origasa. And he was a former samurai of this uh, location. Now, I'm going to start off this story from the first image and then work up my way to the second story. There are three stories in this. I've only found three. Three that was good anyway. Every other anime was either preferred, questionable, um, boring as hell. Four children. Most of the good ones are four children. I don't do children anime. And also, um, the motivations were bad. So, that stepping forward, I'm moving forward with that. I'm going to now... Do Meiji Gekin first, um, Sagaku Tamer second, and last but not least, uh, certainly not least, Ninja Kamui. Uh, why Ninja Kamui would be my third? 
um, simply because it's something I've seen before, but in a different format, but how it's executed is pretty damn good. And Blood and Guts is all, all good and everything, but to be honest with you, if that's your selling factor, and uh, the whole espionage stuff, or not really espionage, uh, the whole action and uncovering the secrets, if that's their selling factor, that's not much to chew on. So I'm starting with my first favorite, then I'll move to my second favorite, which is probably the first favorite. Um, Saigaku Tamer seems to have been the the one that was going probably going to last longer than any, um, simply ha simply because it has um, elements of other animes that are very cutesy, as well as its learning process, because at least its execution of the learning process of how to write a story with characters and how it used magic in this world is very interesting and it's different from any other anime that used magic and magical beast and a fictitious world so the story development and story character in Tamer is pretty good but I'm starting from the one I like the most which is Meiji Gekin 1874 why I like this um, one the, the most I will show you in the process of me going from image to image so the first image you see here is um, the war of 1868 in November now, during this period, the first um, thing that will pop up is the Boshin Wars. The Boshin Wars was a civil war in Japan during this period. And the main reason for this is during the at the end of the Tokugawa period, which is Tokugawa Iyasu first started um, a lot of uh, uh, Im um, import-export um, with foreign nations, Britain, and so on and so forth, other European nations. And it became a common thing with him. So much common that eventually uh, foreign powers started to make threats with regards to the government saying that we have better tech we could invade their land so on and so forth a lot of people that were within the government and locals who are associated with those in the government didn't like that at all went back to their neighboring province told them about it turns out that's what led to the motion wars the civil wars you've allowed foreigners to come into your country and bully you and intimidate you and said that they would take control um, and a lot of these people um, most of them were from the south believed this as well um, which is very strange to me because in the 1900s um, America was having a civil war as well just not at the same time period but it was around the same time period which is very strange to me to this very day while America was having its civil war, after its revolutionary war with um, the British, the British somehow, as well as other foreign nations, decided to come to Japan in this pro process. And maybe, maybe this is a possibility, this is just hypothetical, uh, influence of those events led to the civil war in Japan. But that's just theory. Coincidence probably just happened during the same time. Um, but it's very strange how American Civil War and Japanese Civil War kind of happened during the same century and during around the same decade as, at the same time. Um, maybe not the same decade, but uh, within the same 20-year period from each other. Um, so that's, 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 that has been something that's always been strange to me. How come two civil wars were almost within the same uh, decade or 20 years apart from each other um, that's all always rubbed me the wrong way um, so moving forward from that you see the motion wars with Japanese Civil War and moving on um, on from that we see the first introduction of our protagonist um, Shizuma Origasa and he was a, a samurai during this period and he was um, from Aizu a very realistic location and very prominent within the uh, time period of the motion wars they were on the side of the emperor while the Tokugawa was on the side of, well, the Tokugawa himself and under the shogunate. Of course, you know about Japanese history. Japanese history was ruled by two different types. One who were warlords and the other were emperors. Warlords took over the spot of emperors when they didn't like how the emperor was running things and became a dictator. And eventually, warlords became dictators themselves and, where, uh, and the people got desperate in order to overpower them. Now, the difference between Oda Nobunaga, and, um, Toyotomi, and uh, Tokugawa, Tokugawa was fair with, with regards to his ruling. 
the fairness pretty much came to an end when foreigners came to the land, and that's how the Civil War of the Boshin War started. Eventually, the imperial side, those who refer to way of the emperor, won. Aizu won, and they simply won simply because they used the enemy strategy against them, which is, you decide to bring guns and firearms and revolvers and all this into our country, we're going to use the same type of strategy against you. They bought Gatling guns, they bought explosive um, artillery fires, all I'm, I'm assuming was a extreme investment on their part probably bankrolled themselves um, uh, uh, like under underground supporters who knows um, maybe even bankrupt themselves as well um, but they won and during the process of that winning on ISU side the imperial side um, we got what is called the Meiji era the Meiji restoration which was in 1870 uh, early 1870s, 1872, no, 1873, 1874, 1875, 1876. Um, during this period was called the, the period of Meiji Restoration. The beginning was 1873, first installed, and then became a well-known thing, 1874. And from there on, moving forward, everything was Meiji Restoration until it became full of Meiji. Uh, and du also during this period, a lot of people didn't like how the Meiji were running things because... The Meiji were, were actually, um, didn't hold the Tokugawa era people accountable fully. They just incorporated their existence within the Meiji. Um, so it, it wasn't like the Tokugawa fully went away. It was, the Meiji was still a part of the Tokugawa, though there were no, no more Tokugawas. Um, the imperial class, or the emperor, was put back in place, but in order to keep things uh, moving forward, um, just the Meiji era pretty much um, were for the side of the opposition rather than for the side of the emperor. So that said, that's how the story of Meiji Gekken came to be. And that's how our friend Shizuma uh, Origasa um, came to be the hero of the story. And he's a slash samurai slash police officer. And there are certain characters, primary characters, secondary characters, tertiary characters, and the tertiary characters, uh, or should I say the secondary characters in this, is a girl called Shuzume. She was very important to the story. Now the brother, however, um, who is this gentleman over here, um, to the far right, is pretty much dead. Uh, he died during, this is a spoiler, I, I do all my anime spoil. He's pretty much dead. So moving forward from that, he requested that um, um, uh, Shizuma uh, takes care of his sister, um, Sume. Her full name is Sume Kanamato, I believe. And his full name was uh, Shizuma Origasa, which I just said. And during that period, that year after the Boshin War came to an end, seven years have passed, and seven years and one month have passed since that period, and it's now 1874. The now beginning of the story so you have the intro of the story what that was all about and to be honest with you it was pretty weak it was weak sauce so logically if you were to be a critic of this anime you were you would probably say nah this is not a good start it's not a good hook i'm not interested but as a person who's very good at actually watching things and deciphering things and taking it apart you continue on forward so continuing on forward now in the age of steam engines and power and basically everything that were that was present in the US or in England is now present in Japan. You can't really distinguish um, one from the other uh, with regards to towns and locations and houses. You could basically see it here within the house of everything and within the carriages, within um, how the times have changed from which the Tokugawa was, how houses look during the Tokugawa period, to how houses look now, and how homes look now during the Meiji Restoration period. However, certain things are kept. The interior of their houses and the interior, uh, interior design within each house has always been Japanese, as well as certain other things that kept us more efficient has always been around. Uh, during this period, we get to meet a lot of people During this period, we get to meet a lot of people as well. One of these people is um, a revolutionist, 
and during this revolutionist time, uh, you can basically say he's um, uh, how would I describe him? He's a real character within history. Um, not really a revolutionist, but kind of. He's more of um, he's a stupid man, I would say. Um, he believes in tradition to the fault of tradition is the only way to do a thing. Um, there's also the factor of him being a extreme influential character with regards to what happened in history. Now, if I'm getting this character completely wrong, I would say this character is based off someone who you very much know during the Restoration P period, which is known as Gensuke. Now, Gensuke is, is not present in this anime as far as I know, or unless this character is going under the same similar name and is used differently. It could be that, or it could be something else. Uh, this is also a character that's very real in um, Japanese history. Um, and this is also a character that's very real within Japanese history. He was a real superintendent during the Meiji period, during the Meiji Restoration era. He was very influential with regards to how the law was carried throughout that country and how things happened in that country. Now, mind the noise that you hear around you. Um, I'm pretty much living in a place where there's noise everywhere and people can't seem to mind their own business and do their own thing, but I don't have the power in order to stop the noise that you hear around you. Um, morning, noon, night, you will always hear noise within the background. It's simply that type of building. Um, moving on from that, this real life superintendent, which is a superintendent that existed in history within uh, the major restoration period, we get to meet our secondary character, or should I say another secondary character. His name is um, uh, uh, Tochimichi um, Okubo, very much known through the Meiji Restoration period and is the person that basically created the Meiji uh, Restoration with regards to Japan. Um, if anyone has ever watched a Rioni Kenshin anime, they know who this person is. Um, so he is present in this anime as well. Also present in this anime is the guy known as Hajime, Hajime um, Saito. But during the period of the Meiji Restoration, he went by the name of um, Fujita. And Fujita is very Goro Fujita, and it's very much present in here as an assassin for the police department. Um, so, uh, those who like Ryan Kenjin might like this a lot because one, it doesn't give the bravado, the bravado that Ryan Kenjin does. It gives a more realistic aspect with regards to how events played out in history, locally wise and how characters fought realistically, locally wise. There was no like wing style and superpowers or any of that stuff and charging up. This is more like a realistic version and dumbed down version of that. Maybe that's one of the reasons why people don't like it that much because it's more like watching an opera or a drama. And that's the reason why I like it so much. It's like watching a live action or watching a live TV series but done in anime form of real events that happened in the past. And they did this with regards to this anime very well. How much very well? I will tell you how much. Each character that I've shown you in this anime so far, each play a significant part to the development of the story moving forward. This character, her name is, if I remember clearly, uh, she's a spy, a Japanese spy for the British. And she's working directly under the British in order to get information about what Okubo and what the superintendent are doing with regards to Meiji Restoration. So the Brits aren't for the Meiji Restoration, but they're not against the Meiji Restoration either. Now, the Brits aren't for the Yakuza, but they're also not against the Yakuza either. Now... The government is neither for Yakuza either, and they're not against Yakuza, or for Meiji, or against Meiji. Basically, no one is taking no one's side. This is mo very much a story where there is, even though there is a protagonist, there is not really a protagonist. Our protagonist of this story does not feel like a protagonist. Our protagonist of this story feels like a character in a play. He is the main protagonist of the story, and many scenes are centered around him. But many scenes go back and forth with regards to events that are playing out in the story. This is a story story. 
this is not a character story. And maybe that's the reason why this would deviate from certain people than from others. Maybe certain people want a character story rather than a story drama. This is a story story, a generalized story, but focus on historical events done from the part of many different facets. Individuals coming from different eras going towards a central point. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's the end to any story. And all of these characters coming from all directions are going towards a central point, um, leading up to possible Second Civil War. That's the central point. The events that are playing out here are leading to that point. And each of these characters are very important. Some realistically part of history, some completely fictitious, fictitious for this anime. But they are all playing their parts out accurately. At many times, you would think that the spy, the journalist, uh, Senri, this woman here, who mm -hmm. this is not her real hair, that the story is somewhat, somewhat focused around her, but not really. And when you watch this um, events with regards to Okubo, you would feel like the story is really about center around Okubo, and everyone else is just playing a part in assistance towards Okubo. And in the next scene, uh, moving forward, this scene, you would think that the events are playing mainly with regards to our main protagonist. But at certain scenes, it doesn't feel that way at all. Certain scenes, it feels like it's going towards the spy for the British, and his name is Parks. This is the person she reports to. But that's not the case. This is an anime where many things are happening all at the same time. I feel like I'm watching an Avengers movie and there are so many players on the field. But this is to another level with regards to playing out story and each character slowly but surely getting fleshed out or events leading towards that story is fleshing out through these characters. So continuing on with the story, Origaso is stopped by police. He told them he's from Aizu. They tried to arrest him. He ran away. They're, they chased after him. We get to the next scene. We see her reporting back to the British envoy named Parks to remove the headdress of her spying on Okubo. The next scene, we get to a different person. Well, we get to the same person. She put back on her headdress to pretend like she's an uh, against her, against she. Um, and she's counting the money. She's a basically a, a spy for them and works for them. She's not really loyal to the British. Like I said, no one's really loyal to anyone except for their own. And the British are loyal to British. The government's loyal to the government. Um, the Yakuza is loyal to the Yakuza. And those from Aizu are also loyal to those from Aizu. Speaking of loyalty, this gentleman right here, he is also a secondary character. In other words, you, you kind of you would kind of consider him the protagonist of the story as well. Um, but he's not really the protagonist of the story. He would be considered the false antagonist of the story. The main antagonist of the story, I'll get to him later, is a very evil man. Um, so evil that you would consider him to be using the Brits as well, and the Yakuza, and those who are loyalists, as well as common folk, everyday common folk. This guy... His motivations is quite simple. You kill my people. You took the lives of those who I love. You try to manipulate my countrymen. And you try to destroy my clan and my localized town. His name is Shirogami Kyoshiro. I wrote his name down specifically because I couldn't remember his. Um, probably wrote down the girl's name as well, Senri. Yeah, I wrote her name down as well. Um, you know, Shizuma and Sume, those I remember because they're attached to each other. Sume is the fiance of Shizuma, and she's also, she will also play a big part in regards to the story moving forward, episode by episode by episode. Uh, to point out the fact that this is the only anime I've watched all the way past the sixth episode. Every anime I've watched so far has gone up to the fourth or the third episode most. This is the only anime I've watched past the seventh episode simply six to seven episode simply because this is a full-on drama i'm watching a full-on drama series happening here violence only happens in this anime when it happens 
the player in this game is the story and how events are playing out in the story and how each person plays their part in the story. This gentleman called um, uh, Suga, uh, Shiragami is basically one eye samurai from you know motion war errors um, out for revenge. He's using the Yakuza and he's playing this guy as well. And well, this he's not really playing this guy, but he's playing everyone in the room in this gambling house in order to acquire information. Uh, with regards to Buhei. Buhei is the person responsible for his clan or for his town's destruction and he's searching on his revenge path to get um, to get even with this guy or, or to kill him as you would for your honor and for your family. The other two gentlemen with him are his personal I wouldn't say bodyguards but personal assassins. Uh, there are three of them. There's I wrote it down, there's Dario, um, Gensho, and Guen. One, Dario is an archer, which is a female. Um, she's a female, pretty good archer. Uh, Gensho is a mystic, mystical old man, the short one that you see right here. And he's an explosive expert. Um, and Gen, uh, Genu would be more like um, the tank of the group. A very big boy, very um, sumo type with a... You know sword skills as well so he have three people um, that works under him so in many ways it feels like I'm watching Rio and Kenshin and the various different uh, groups that are within Rio and Kenshin or factions that's within Rio and Kenshin but it's not like Rio and Kenshin at all that was my expectations when I heard like uh, you know Goro Fujita was in here and Okubo was in here so I started to think that maybe it will go in that direction when it comes to action scenes and when it comes to story. It doesn't go in that direction at all. This is nothing like that. These are just characters playing out their role in a generalized story. If anything, this is more like you're watching a TV drama, TV series, or a full-on Netflix drama. It has nothing to do with specialized power and skills and action. This is more about executing part of history accurately and executing part of a story the way you want to execute it in association to events in history. That's why I like this. Moving forward from that, we get to another scene where we see um, another historical event that happened. Those who were from Satsuma and Chosho uh, have been known for trying to execute Okubo during the Meiji Restoration. And it goes the same here. Um, our little boy that we saw before, and bearded man we saw before, at the gambling house and before within the uh, rickety shack um, or ricket uh, runners um, that was inside that uh, vehicle uh, tried to do an assassination with regards to Okubo. However, the superintendent was um, in the vehicle and carried a gun, shot one of the, his men, came out, said, we, we knew you were going to try to assassinate Okubo. We were ready. And also what happens here, um, for some reason, one of the assassins gave um, our friend here the gun, uh, our bearded man here the gun, who was trying to kill Okubo. Um, he's not really relevant to the story, so I don't really remember his name. I know his name, but he's not really relevant, so I'm not going to mention it. Um, and he shot, um, yeah, he shot a, our friend here, Origasa. After Origasa holed up one of his men, with the knife through the throat or with the blade through the throat um they didn't realize that even though he was a um, you know a rider a, a day runner a rider uh, carrying people around um that he was actually a samurai from the samurai age of the Boshin wars so he took them out pretty easy but in the end he got shot i i actually thought he was dead as well so he's not dead the bullet went straight into the headband that represent his friend from aizu uh, or his headband from Aizu during the time of Boshin Wars to save his life. He thinks it's a curse, but he's not dead and the anime can go on. He jump kicked the guy, knocked him out, cold clocked him out. Police officers took him away. Superintendent congratulate Origasu. Origasu walked away and the superintendent got it in his mind to actually recruit Origasu for the police department during the following day. Eventually, um, our friend here, Buhi, finally makes his appearance and realize that um, Okubo, the superintendent, are becoming a problem. So he decided to 
use the Yakuza to his advantage um, in order to weed them out. It doesn't really go his way, but he decided to stay in the shadows even more. In fact, it turns out that he learns that um, uh, Surigami is after him. When he learns of it, this is another story. But eventually, um, Origasa joins um, the police force, makes friends with the guy that was bullying him before about him being from Aizu. It becomes a big story of uh, him and this tertiary character, or tertiary characters. And eventually it got long, they start fighting um, against bad guys, local people, even Yakuza. Became a, it becomes a big thing. By the time you got to about episode episode three, you know, they're, they're together. And then we finally get to learn a lot more about Suzume. She was working as um, a, Genshin, a Genshi within a, a house. Um, and it turns out that she's actually sick from uh, internal disease. She's a fiance of Origasa. Uh, she's a certain age now, and also we learn from this character more fleshing out, more fleshing out coming. Um, she was part of a all female group that attacked those who were loyal to um, uh, the Tokugawa during the Boshin Wars. Turns out, um, during the Meiji era, she's trying to get revenge against the Meiji and Okubo because. Um, most of the people from the Tokugawa were part of um, either the police department or still governmental officials in charge. And um, Okubo was part of that as well. Now, whether it's Okubo is for the Tokugawa is a different story, uh, which he's not. Um, but she sees the uh, Meiji as those who were on the side of the Tokugawa during that period. So they weren't fully held accountable for. And so she wants to make sure they're held accountable for Moving forward from that, the assassination attempt on Okubo's life with the gun in that douchebag's hands was given from her. She gave them the gun. Su Sume gave um, uh, the guy the gun to try to kill uh, Okubo, end up shooting the, her very own, uh, with the same gun he gave to him, end up shooting her very own fiance. She doesn't know this. She actually thinks her fiance, Origasa, is dead. She's never seen him before. It's been years. She's gone missing and turns out that she's now an assassin for hire against the very man for which she doesn't know is the actual true bad guy of the story. See, uh, Sume assumes that this guy is trying to bring back the, the tradition of Japan as well as um, allow her to have her revenge and certain things to happen. Um, that's beneficial towards her as a whole. If she could get her revenge, if she could bring peace to her own clan, or bring some type of sensible peace to herself, she's willing to follow this guy. And she doesn't, I'm not sure if he really cares about his motivation or who she is. In total, he's willing to help her to get her revenge. So, she doesn't know him like the people who are watching the enemy knows him, or like the, his enemies know him. She basically is using him in order to get what she wants. So that's why I'm saying this This anime goes all over the place. And maybe that's the reason why certain people don't like it. But for me, it's very fluent and it's very easy for me to understand. You have the bad guys doing the bad guy thing. You got the good guys doing the good guy thing. You get the secondaries doing the secondary thing and the tertiary is doing the tertiary thing. Everything is clearly defined and their motivations are clearly defined to me. I understand what's going on even though it's just chopped up. There's different players that are happening. What people need to understand is that all the events within Meiji, Gekin, 1874 are all playing out all at the same time. It's just that the director is making you see events from different perspectives while they're happening all at the same time. So it's not like it's jumping all over the place. It's just telling the events that are happening all at the same time from different people point of view. Now we go here to another scene. We get to see another situation happening. Two people are in a room. One who was a loyalist towards um, those of the Tokugawa era, a real sadistic guy that has fun in killing women uh, um, in the forest. Uh, not really relevant to the story moving forward, but very relevant towards um, Suzume's, um, well, I keep calling her Su Suzume, uh, Sume, Sume's revenge. So now that we know that this is the guy responsible for the death of all her girl soldiers or all the women soldiers or all the 
I never put into context why there were so many women soldiers during the time of the Boshin Wars, because the anime never defined why there were so many women warriors during the Boshin Wars. And it, they were, there weren't ninjas, there were just women fighting on the side during the Boshin Wars. And it was an all women group. Why that happened is unknown. The anime didn't explain this. Did that happen in history is also unknown. It wasn't defined within this anime, so I might have to look that up on my own. Uh, if that did happen during the time of the Boshin Wars, the Civil War in uh, Japanese history, then that's another plus I'll add towards this anime. If it's something just fictitious for this anime, I'll keep it at that. So this guy's been identified um, based around Origasa and uh, his fellow compatriot, uh, police officer in the woods trying while well, Origasa and his friend are trying to save a girl from being assassinated. They got wind of this bad guy. Um, they took him out pretty quick, but in the end, after they arrest him, Suzume, that's why I keep saying I like this anime a lot. Suzume um, got her revenge by using a um, long range um, rifle. Uh, I wouldn't call it a sniper rifle, but who knows? Maybe this was the first sniper rifle um, introduced within this anime, or maybe during the period of Japan's first introduction with regards to foreign weapons. Um, this was one of the first, if not the first, model class of sniper rifles back then. Now, she would have to be a badass aim and a badass, you know, badass bitch to, to classify this as, as such to aim from that distance with a rifle from way back in the days, which didn't have accuracy with regards to um, aiming, wind direction, all those factors. She would have to be proficient at using this in order to get that headshot. And she did get that headshot. And it was pretty cool. When I saw it, I was like, oh man, this is badass as hell. So Suzumi is not just an assassin. She's a sniper, um, an elite sniper, you, being the fact that this is an ancient rifle, um, it's not even classified if it's a rifle or not, but I'm assuming that it's a rifle. It cannot be a regular, you know, rifle. It has to be a long range rifle because um, she was at quite a distance. So he had to had to have been a long range rifle or, a, or an experimental rifle. Either way, rifle, clean headshot, guy is dead. She got her revenge but she hasn't taken out Okubo yet. So, like I said before, this anime is, you feel like they're, each character within this anime has its own beating heart and its own mo motivations. And each time when you see events playing out with regards to characters, you start to think to yourself, this anime really does not have a protagonist. It, that's how it feels, even though it really does. And the protagonist plays his part out well when he's on screen for the events associated with him. But when he's not on screen, you feel like it's someone else is the protagonist. Moving forward, we now get to the part within the story known as Gekin. Meiji Gekin from 1874. So a couple of episodes in, we now reach the Gekin part. Moving on from that, and Gekin is basically a combat competition with regards to events happening in Japan during this period. So this video might go on for about a good two hours, but I have to get through all of them before it ends. So this is Gekin. This is the event that you've been waiting for. This event is like any other, it's like a UFC combat event, but during the ancient time of Japan, moving over for that, um, from that period, we have eight fighters that are going to be presented in this Gekin. Now Gekin is, I don't fully understand what Gekin is, but I fully kind of understand what Gekin is trying to do. Um, it's trying to go down a combat route, Dragon Ball Z route, um, you know, Hunter Hunter fighting route. You have to have something in your anime to flesh out all the talking. And that's what Gekin is, or Gekin Kai is. A combat situation, an event, a video game event, a live action event, a television event, a movie event to water down all the drama. And that's what this is. It's like you're playing a game and 
the developers drop a new update and that update and then and that specific update is an event and that's what the Geken Kai is and that's the reason why the name Geken is within this anime as well so I'm starting to wondering like where the hell is this Geken that they keep talking about because this is just a soap opera I'm watching and then it drops it on you Geken Kai starts I believe it started the Geken Kai started during the third episode or I could be wrong, it could have started during the fourth episode, but Gekken is here. And once Gekken starts, that's when the anime kind of shifts from being a story-based anime to now a combat-based anime. It's no longer about just the story. It's about winning the Gekken as well and revealing certain motivations during the period of Gekken, uh, the Gekken Kai. So we have our different competitors. We have a total of eight they each showing off their skills during the Gekken Kai. And during this period of the Gekken Kai, word got to um, uh, Buhei that events in the Gekken Kai are happening. So he's sending people, I, I believe he's sending people to participate in the Gekken Kai through the Yakuza. So he wants his stake in the Gekken Kai because the Gekken Kai is important towards Japanese culture as a total. Now, whether, whether this is something that happened during uh, event, events in uh, Japan's history is still unknown to me, but I'll be yet to actually look that up to see if that was true. Um, certain events happened during Japan's history, yes, but will it, is it important enough to change the shift with regards to who's ruling, who's not ruling, who's in charge, who's not in charge, is unknown to me. Um, because I'm not looking at this anime for that. I'm looking at this anime for what the anime is offering by itself. Moving on from that, we now get to this character. This is a character that's going to be par participating in the Gekken. I'm not going to say his name because it's, I don't believe he's relevant to, to know. He's not a big factor with regards to winning the Gekken. He's just another um, participant in the Gekken. Um, but he's very important in the Gekken. But he's not very important towards the story as a whole. However, this person here is very important towards the Gekken Kai of this anime and very important towards take a sip of my coffee I gotta take a sip for this guy um, he's very important to me and it's very important to uh, the history of Japan and he's very important to um, to many lores as well in many animes this guy he looks nothing like the Saito I remember from various different animes. And there have been many animes about the Shins and Gumi. This guy is Hajime Saito, or since he's a police officer, Goro Fujita. Um, the period of the Boshin Wars is over. He sided with the police officer in a uh, police department in order to keep things at peace. He's known in this anime as the Crow. He's not known as the Wolf. So to differentiate between those who have watched any anime with regards to um, Goro Fujita, but it's reference to his existence in, um, what's the name of that anime? I don't remember it. Gintama, or reference to the Shin Zagumi in Gintama, or reference to the Shin Zagumi in Kenshin, or reference to the Shin Zagumi in other uh, Shin Zagumi related anime, um, which I remember one. Clearly, I, I just don't remember the name. This guy has been portrayed in many different ways in many different animes, but his name cannot be portrayed. You can't make up his name. He's a real character in real life. He really existed, and he's a representation of, of a historical character who is significant towards the development of things within the government as well as within the local body of Japan's local province. Um, so moving on from that, we get to see another scene, and this guy um, is not the crow. Oh wait a minute, is it the same? Is he the same? No, no, no. I'm getting this all wrong. I'm all backwards. This is not a good guy. <laughs> I'm getting this all backwards. This is not a good guy. He's called the crow because he's definitely a bad guy. And the moment I saw him with this uh, friend of his, I soon realized that this guy was a bad guy. I don't know how I got that wrong. 
Saito is very much different, and he wears a pair of glasses. His hair is different as well. The crow is on the side of Buhei, participating in the Gekenkai. Correct. I had to correct myself. He's present here. There he is. There is Saito. Saito is here, the guy with the bow tie and the glasses. Um, where is he? The crow is not here. The crow is not present in the competition. We have um, Shirigami. Then we have this guy who fought Shirigami before within um, Yakuza or gambling place. Then we have Fujita, Goro Fujita, uh, Saito. Then we have this other character who's all about luck. Then we have the strongest person in uh, the Gekenkai, this female here. Uh, we'll get to her uh, later on. But for the story's sake, moving forward, I'm going to skip past her name. Um, if anyone remembers the character Ran Tusuke Kage, um, she kind of is wearing the same thing as Ran Tusuke Kage. It was an anime from the past, and she's basically the Kenshin of this anime. Pretty much, she's the Kenshin of this anime. That I'm, I won't be getting wrong. About the only thing I made a mistake was the last thing before. This person is not that important. He's not that important. And our boy... Um, Origasa's right there. So there are four people that are very important within the Gekken Kai. Um, this person, this person, this person, and this person. The two main players are of the story are our false antagonist and our main protagonist, which is at the far left and the far right, which is kind of hilarious that two opposing forces are at the very end. That's story writing for you. Um, and the two characters who are, who are, I would say, are actually the best one out of the, the group is the woman and probably Hajime Saito. But it's not explained that they're the best. You just kind of know that they're the best throughout the anime. Moving forward from that, the Gekken Kai has started. The competition happens. Um, our, our boy, Arigasu, had to fight this big sumo wrestling guy kind of got his ass kicked but at the same time he kind of did a sumo move on him and threw him out of the ring that's how that ended the remaining of the anime didn't end the way you would expect it to the remaining of the anime ended with her boasting about her being the best because she is the best um for, for the life of me i don't remember her name um so i'm moving over for moving on from that uh, we get to the next section where we see his friend gets killed. I don't know his name because I didn't write his name down because I don't remember his name. But he was actually very relevant towards the story. I completely forgot that he got killed. And, well, I didn't forget. I just forgot his name because I didn't consider him to be a relevant factor throughout the story. Because he is not a relevant factor throughout the story. The simple fact that they killed him off before the fifth episode. Um, what was it during the fifth episode? I would have to go back. Um, they killed him off as a proof that he wasn't going to last long within this uh, anime. So, that's it. He's dead. He got killed by um, uh, our boy, uh, Shirogami, because he decided to ambush our boy, Shirogami. And the reason why he decided to ambush our boy, Shirogami, was from the scene earlier, where he was influenced by the crow, a guy that works for Buhei, who is an actual um, police officer on the police force. Both of them are real cops. Um, well, this guy's a real cop, too. He's not pretending to be a cop um, while working for uh, a corrupt guy on the side. He's actually a cop cop. And he influenced him uh, in order to interact with, um, Bu well, not Buhe, interact with Shirogami on a street. Shirogami is clearly more skilled than him. He got killed in the process. During that time period, she was boasting about winning. So this happened the night before. And when he got uh, knocked out, this happened actually no yeah this happened the night before word of his death got uh went to origasa and origasa went to interact with uh shirigami in the competition and he tried to kill him during the competition and shirigami retaliated if i remember clearly and eventually he got knocked out by hajime saito and Ajime Saito put them in the hospital because he doesn't know that Saito works for the police as an uh, assassin for the superintendent. He doesn't know that yet. Because Saito's role in this is a 
either a spy is both spy and assassin for the police department. It's very weird how so many spies are in this anime. You got a spy for the government, you got a spy for the Yakuza, you got a spy for Buhei, you got a spy for the police department. Spies all over the place. It's very interesting. Um, and then you got her boasting about her skills because her skills because she's extremely powerful. She doesn't look like it, but she is. And she decides to take on Origasa as her apprentice because she kind of have this thing for Origasa, but um, it's not stated that she has a thing for him. You, you could just know that she has a thing for him, um, which is going to be a huge problem down the road when he, Origasa finds out that his fiance Sume is actually alive. Eventually, they will meet each other. Not right now, or not even by the seventh, or probably not even by the eighth episode. So that's going to be a problem down the road when they both meet. And, you know, he eventually developed feelings for this girl while at the same time has feelings for Sume. And that's going to be a problem. That's why I say it. this is like watching a drama. Moving on from that, I'm trying to cut through many episodes real quick. Moving on through that, you get to the next episode where we see um, Suri, uh, Shirigami finally meets finally meet Buhei. But the truth is Buhei set up this meeting to happen because he learned of uh, Shirigami's present that Shirigami was using the Yakuza both the Morai and the Fu uh, uh, Fujishima uh, Yakuza clan competing Yakuza clan he was using both of them in order to get Buhei to show his face but Buhei learned that uh, Shirigami was using both of them and he realized they were both idiots and Shirigami was simply putting them up against each other Showing his face was revealing himself in order to lure Shirigami into this conflict with him. However, he did not see this coming. Uh, Buhei didn't see this coming. He did not see that the samurai, which was supporting one side of the um, Moria clan, or was it Fujishima? Yeah, the samurai that was supporting, or, or you know, the Yojimbo, or the assassin, however you want to call him that was supporting the Fujishima um, Yakuza was actually working for uh, Shirigami. And on the Moria side, um, whispers of how to deal with them happened through his other friends as well, through Daria and through um, Bensho. So they were there to support um, Shirigami just in case things went south and things did go south. And it turns out, um, uh, Genyu, uh, the big guy, can do body transformation manipulation. Apparently, that's another one of his skills. He's not just a tank or a good swordsman. He can actually make his body compressed and look either frail or muscular. And that's a skill that he's always had. I'm assuming this guy is a ninja. Um, but I can't fully identify that any of these people are ninjas. They could just be samurai that understand ninja ways. But the basically the end of the story, um, by the seventh episode, um, Buhei reveals himself. Um, Shiragami gets his revenge, but not really because Buhei managed to escape. Though Shiragami almost killed him because Buhei doesn't have that type of uh, sword skills. His intimidation and his power lies within those who he has under his control and those who he has in range. So he tried to shoot him with a whole bunch of artillery fire. Turns out he didn't realize um, uh, Shirigami had an archer on him, um, watching from a distance, sniping people, and didn't realize that Shirigami also had a mystic on him to make people see things that aren't really there. So he knew that um, Shirigami would have backup, but he didn't know the type of backup that he would have. So he thought artillery fire with regards to those who were supporting him would all be in the room, and that size of both Moria and both uh, Fujishima would help him in the process. So this guy was very cocky, assuming he was going to win. Turns out that, uh, you know, uh, Shirigami had knowledge on both sides of the Yakuza and people hiding on, at least on one side of the Yakuza, in order to have them fight each other out, as well as have backup both inside of the room that he was with, with Buhei, as well as at long distance. So... Um, this guy wasn't going to die easy. Shirigami wasn't going to die easy. So why I say this guy is kind of like the antagonist, the false antagonist? Even though he killed that other guy's friend, 
And even though he's um, seen as the bad guy of the story because he was working for the Yakuza, willing to work for anyone in order to get his revenge, the simple fact that he's willing to get revenge about so against someone for doing something that was wrong um, has nothing to do with him trying to man ma manipulate the culture or or anyone in order to attain something out of power. So he's he might be the, the false antagonist of the story, but he's not really the antagonist of the story. The real antagonist of the story is the Buhei uh, Hiramatsu. So that's the end of this anime. Um, moving on to the next one is the second story of this story, and it's called um, Saijaku Tamer wa Gami Hira. And I will just call it Tamer. So if you, or Saijaku Tamer, if you don't want to call it, it's something about um, wordless Tamer or something. The English name is very strange, but if if someone ever mentions, have you seen the Tamer anime or the Saijaku Tamer anime, they would know what you're talking about. So this is about a little girl. This little girl name is Ivy. And the first scene in this anime is her running away. The second scene in this anime is showing the antagonist of the story, which is very strange. The first scene of the anime shows the anime character running away. And directly after, in contrast to that, we get to see the, the second scene with regards to the person chasing the first which is the main antagonist of the story. Going back and forth with regards to these two characters, little is known about our main antagonist. Only thing that's known about the main antagonist is that he's the village um, leader and he believes in traditional ways to a fault um, in associating to something very much cult-like. So he's like a cult-like leader. And if you break their sacred belief, um, you're going to die. And in this case, the sacred belief is if you don't have certain type of stars, if you don't have stars associated with your existence in this village, then you deserve to die. Having no stars is a bad thing. Having even one star, two star, three star is a good thing. No stars is a very bad thing. This is a world where magic exists. This is a world where violence exists. This is a world where um, where fantasy and possibly warlocks, wizards, witches, all this exists in this world. Um, what makes this anime very different from Geken, uh, Gekenkai or Meiji Geken 1874 and makes it, makes it different from also um, uh, Ninja Kamui is that why in some cases this is considered the best anime to have come out in uh late January, early February, um, by many, is because the main character of the story is this little girl, and her being a little girl is not a factor. Her being a little girl running from people who are trying to kill her is a factor. Her being a little girl running from people who are trying to kill her because she has no stars, which means she has no magical potency in order to assist the village so they have to kill her, is a factor. This little girl running in the woods, walking in the woods, trying to survive, eating food, cooking uh, little critters that she find, anything in order to survive on her own is a great hook for an anime. So if you discluded the factor of being killed from the anime itself, just a little girl trying to survive in the woods by herself and not starve to death, cook her own food, catch her own animals, all this, is a good hook for an anime. You will ask yourself, why the hell is this little girl by herself in the lost woods trying to kill um, kill animals and cook and trying to survive on her own? In all truth, a person like this would die from either the weather or from crazy animals or from crazy people a long time ago. But the fact that this anime would has the power of magic in it you could use magic for anything, including to disguise yourself or to run or even to keep quiet or, or to uncover certain things as well as to stock up on things in order to survive. Her skill is the ability to tame animals, which is very strange for someone who has no stars because she wanted to be a tamer when she was a child and she grew up to be a tamer as an adult. But she has no stars attached to her, though she has the ability to tame animals, or beasts in this case. So, moving forward from that, we get to the next scene of her leaving the village or running away from the village that's trying to kill her. Um, she finds 
different bags and each of these bags are magic bags same thing when you have any magic bag in any game a good example is the Dark Souls game you realize you could collect so many swords over and over and over again repeat and you're putting them all within an inventory bag and you just throw them in and micromanage it the bag micromanages the shield or the sword or the elemental weapon or even the healing properties that's what magical bags are the tool for holding things that are ridiculous size and putting them down regardless of what size they are they're able to fit in a bag so you could carry it on your back and the weight of the, the bag on your back is not a factor with regards to what you're using it for because I've never played any game that actually you're wearing a bag and the bag is weighing on you because you have too much stuff however that does work in certain games such as Resident Evil games if you're carrying too much stuff you have to leave certain things but it doesn't factor that much in fictional stories with regards to fantasy um, that seems to be a thing a motif with regards to fantasy so that said that's something that fascinated me with regards to this anime moving forward how she could just take anything and dropping it in the bag and the anime does not explain to you why that is most anime would it just starts off with you seeing a bag and seeing her putting things into the bag and say oh that's an item bag she could store a lot of stuff in it but it's it's very strange it's very strange how the anime focuses on the bag every time she puts stuff in the bag as if the bag itself has a life of its own and the bag the bag itself is very special for events to happen and that's very important to this anime because the bags are kind of like their own characters attached to her or attributes of herself I don't know like completely what it is about the bags that's very mysterious but it gives kind of an airy feeling as well as an important feeling but you have a type of feeling of eeriness about them that's not something that's considered good but at the same time they are considered good um, that said moving forward we get to learn something else about this anime why I believe this would be an, uh, a number one in many people's um, minds it would be the factor of someone else is talking to her and it also be the factor of this person that's talking to her is not of her world this is a story of reincarnation and it's assumed or it's, there's no assumption about it it's stated in the anime that she but she knows that she was reincarnated into this world and she knows that the person she was reincarnated from is the one that's speaking to her now this is the first in anime never before have we got an anime where your previous self is actually talking to you talking to her from where talking to her from what talking to her from how nothing is explained about this other character that she used to be all that we know is that this character that she used to be can speak to her which is very odd to me is that it's as if they know about the events that are happening of this character because they live the life of this character before either in this world or in another world and it's clearly stated that this character was from another world and she got born into this world as this girl now unlike most reincarnated stories the mystery behind this mystery character of this other world is very much like the game beyond two souls or very much like many anime or many games where it feels like you're someone's talking to you an alien force within your body a parasite but it's not a parasite and it's not a someone different it is her but it's her from somewhere else it's not like in control game where it's an alien force talking to her um, the character Jesse and this it's her but it's her from somewhere else but is that person from somewhere else still at that somewhere else or is that person dead already and this is their soul inside her lingering or if it's not their soul there has to be some type of magical gateway that they're able to talk to each other now this is a reincarnation of a person you used to be so the used to be body the corporeal body has to be dead so what remains has to be remnants of the person's characteristics that still exist within her like 
is part of her arm, like something like an ocelot from a male gear. You know, liquid speaking through ocelot, something like that. So moving on from that, we get to the next scene. We get to see slime. Slime is a main factor in the story. It's not like that animated slime. The slime in here are more like a tool we use for either destroying things, healing things, or amplifying things. Slime are used very interesting in this anime. They can devour, or they can heal, or they can reproduce. They're very efficient and very effective with regards to what they are in this anime. So the gentlemen that were looking for her use slime in order to destroy evidence of certain things or just to destroy properties leading towards um, her or, or things that's necessary for the survival of the slime because what a slime consumes is also essential part of what a slime enjoys or is part of their elemental makeup it's very strange what they are slime on in like that anime uh, well, how i got reincarnated as a slime is not exactly how they are in this anime so moving over from that you get to see her cut her hair off because people are chasing her down. She needs to remove her hair. She removes her hair. She cuts her hair off. She is now seen as a boy. She goes around as a boy. And I can't really, I guess in this world, the magical property of cutting your hair off equivalents to, oh, I can't tell that you're a girl anymore. So magically you're a boy. Well, it's very stupid. It's about the only thing that I would say that's a takeaway from this anime. All of a sudden you could see that she's, you know, clearly a still a girl but since around this age period in anime or animation young boys and young girls are, looks very much the same so if you cut your hair off it means i guess in this world that you're a boy if you have short hair so even if you look feminine features you, as long as you have short hair you're all of a sudden a boy so it's the only takeaway I, I would say that's not good with regards to this anime and then we meet our character our, her future character of this game, a secondary character, which is a slime. And he's a slime monster. And the slime monster is like many slime monsters. It all depends on what type of slime this is. Now, this turned out to be a major player and necessary with regards to the story moving forward. And this is a healing slime. Um, as far as I've watched for the past four episodes, this is a healing slime. And slime don't last for too long from what she gathered from information in a book. Their life expand, uh, life expectancy is about one day most, or a couple of hours within a day. Um, and the following day, they, all slimes are meant to die. So how the slimes turn out to survive is that ta -ta 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 -ta, the magical bag came into the scene. This is why I'm saying there's very something very strange about those magic bags. The slime was hiding within a scroll, in her map scroll, within the empty bag. And so the slime just came out when she pushed her hand into the empty bag in order to get the scroll out. Because she wanted the scroll, so this, I, I guess you could say that the bag gave her what she wanted. And the slime kind of knew that the bag would, that she, she would take the scroll out from the bag. In order to show it to herself so the slime is kind of self-aware of its own existence and what's necessary for its own existence um, so that would mean that the slime is aware how magical bag works even though she's not fully aware how magical bag works the slime is more aware about it than she is so the slime is within the scroll and it manages to survive the day by going inside the bag. So apparently the bag itself, everything in the world of this magical world doesn't affect the existence of the slime once it's within the inventory system of the bag. It cannot be deleted or executed. This is why I say this anime is very strange. It's like a video game being played out. This character is like a video game character. The magic in this world is like a video game magic. And the inventory system of the usage of the bag is kind of like a video game. But it's not played out like you would watch an anime that's playing out a video game. It has nothing to do with a video game. The whole video game stuff is very much like whispered. It's a whispered. 
is a silent, invisible entity within this world. The guy going to work on his um, on his little cart, pulling wheat or barrels of alcohol, the 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 grass, the windmill, the fences. They all seem to be aspect of created tile sets within the game as in this whole thing is one big game but anime doesn't execute it like it's one big game people being able to create fire by simply waving their hands and their fire develop people be able to create water from out of thin air in order to fill up water jugs this whole thing plays out like one big game but the word game or gaming or anything associated with game is never mentioned in the anime it feels like, I'm starting to feel like, now that I think about it, the girl from the other world might be like a user, but this anime is very low-key down low about it, you know, very down low with regards to what's going on of this person from this other world. But so there's no presentation that is, there's an alien factor of this is a game. You just... Gets the, you just get the feeling that that's happening. But that, in all truth, that's not what's happening at all. It's just taking attributes from what is considered game and placing them into this world without stating it specifically. They're just things that you find enjoyable and entertaining in those worlds and you get to see it play out accurately in this anime. And it's very it's done very well. Those are things that you would have if you were to create an anime that you would do. That certain things, like for instance, the slime only enjoys certain potions, but it doesn't enjoy other potions. Why? Because the slime has certain attributes that are attached to its existence for which the anime is not going to state what those attributes of those existence are. They're sim it's simply going to play out within the behavior of the slime itself and through the exposition, through the slime, and through the story itself. That's why I would consider this to have been the number one if it wasn't for my enjoyment of histor historical characters of Gekenkai and the many players of Gekenkai. Now, why I would consider this to be the possible number one is the backstory of our characters. By episode two, or no, by episode three, we get a backstory of Ivy. When she was a child, it was discovered through her parents that she doesn't have any magical powers. Um, her, her parents kind of didn't want anything to do with her. And her brother and her sister, her younger brother and her sister, sitting at the table, both of them, including the father, mother, the whole family, didn't want anything to do with her just because they had no stars. She, so she had to run away because the damn village elder, uh, leader, not really elder, village, village leader is a psychopath. He's a he's some type of narcissistic, uh, uh, dark cultish type person that believes in outdated philosophies, and he's managed to influence um, her father in such a way that her father is now considering going and looking for his own daughter to kill her straight out. Once she got wind of it, after she snuck into the village to see what was going on with regards to her parents. She followed her father and found this out that her father is planning to kill her. So she took off and realized, okay, there's no hope for me now. Not even my parents want me alive. So it's during this process, during her running away, that she got injured. And the slime turns out that after taking in so many potions, it, just, uh, it started to create like this type of emblem or glow on top of his head, a symbol. To represent what it is i'm not sure if consuming a certain amount of slime allow it to reveal um itself slowly or is the consume uh, or is the consumption of certain potions allow it to level up that it could start having certain features with regards to itself that's what it feels like so its first um duty as its slime is now to heal uh a broken arm from where she fell, either a damaged arm or broken arm from where the girl fell, Ivy fell, and it healed her arm perfectly. So we've now discovered by the third episode that the slime is a healing slime, not a destructive one. 
um, and it could heal anything. But it's very particular about what type of potion that it wants. Now, you could, I guess you could fool it into consuming certain type of potions if you want to, but you would have to mix it up. It's very particular about the type of potion it wants. So that's the key factor of the anime coming into play. It's the very key factor part of this anime and it works for what it is. Now we get some context with regards to what this person from this other world is, but it's shown in a way that this character is very dark. Um, but not dark in a bad way, that dark in a very mysterious way, as if the person walking towards you can either be a threat or can either be a handicap or could either be a savior. The problem with mysterious saviors is that they could either go up, down, or they can be a force of disability for you, a handicap. Not really a help, not really a destroying factor, but a handicap. We don't know who this main character is, but it's assumed based on the anatomy and, or should I say, the silhouette of this character, that is her. It's her with the short hair, as her walking towards herself, as the anime is showing, is showing her walking towards herself. Now, I haven't spoken with regards to how the anime looks so far, with regards to world, with regards to characters, with regards to animation, with regards to story execution, and I don't need to because everything is done perfectly fine. The hook was good, the intro video was good, the fact that she meant the slime, the fact that we discovered the slime is not an average slime, the fact that the, the very mysterious um, bags that she carried on her, um, the fact that the world that we're introduced, we're not thrown directly into wind, uh, into the wind with regards to fantastical creatures. They're slowly but surely revealing themselves in time. Um, ogres have now been presented within the anime. Uh, we now see that big prints of footprints of ogres have been present. And I believe by episode four, it's learned that ogres are a thing in this world. So everything is slowly but surely presenting itself accurately in time. Now, when you're building a story, you could either go for a big punch at the beginning, or you could slowly but gradually lead into that punch. But if you're going to lead into that punch, you have to be able to do more work than a person who just throws you into it at the beginning and then slowly bring you back into that action through certain steps. It's very hard to grab someone's attention while they're sitting in a seat watching a film or anything from the start if your hook isn't powerful enough. The hook of the story was powerful, but not to the power that is ridiculously powerful, but powerful just enough in order to know what was going on. She's running from a village of people trying to kill her because she has no stars. The next scene you see uh, is another creature. This creature is called, if I'm not mistaken, this one I had to write down. This one is called, the hell is this thing called? It's very, it has a long name. This is called an an, uh, a dan dal, yeah, a beast. I'm trying to say that three times fast, or two times fast. Uh, an adal, I see, I can't even say a dandala, uh, uh, an adandala beast. And this adandala beast is like a giant leopard or a giant panther. Um, well, not a giant leopard, a giant panther, um, giant walking panther, like a mixture of a lion and a panther. Um, you know, the lion is much more bulkier and much more bigger. Panther is much more skinnier and darker. So it's a, definitely a panther, but it's beefy like a lion and it's much larger it's like a giant lion or a giant panther um so yeah that moving forward the panther got injured either by someone hunting it or by some accident we don't know but um the slime decided to cover the entire panther or the andandala uh, beast completely healed the beast up and now um ivy has her second beast um tamed but it's not the way uh, that, uh, from what I've learned by under dollar beasts, is that they're very aggressive. So if she's able to tame this very aggressive beast, 
it had to be a circumstance for which it would be tame for. And I guess injury with regards to his body is one of those situations that has to be a prerequisite before it, uh, she can tame it. And healing it um, with magical powers of the slime is a factor that uh, will help it as well. It's part of the whole taming thing. Um, why the and the Andala beast didn't become friends with the slime instead of with her is because the Andala beast sees the slime as her companion. Um, and I guess it's the prerequisite for being uh, uh, friends with a person or with the leader of a group is one must be a supporting character and one must be the main character. So by default, it follows the, the leadership of the leading character than the supporting character. By all means, it probably does follow slime that than it ever would Ivy. But through this anime, that's the direction of where this is going. Now, we're finally, my final scene for this anime is um, two characters. And these are very important characters throughout the story. Um, they also, I have to write down. And one is um, Okta, or, or Okto, and he's the captain of the Latomi um, uh, warrior forces, or watchdog, or watch forces within the Latomi um, location. And just to point out, Latomi and Latomi are two different locations and two different areas. So Ivy is from a village called Latomi, is L-A-T-O-M-I, and Latomi is a much larger and bigger place than Latomi. Why they, they sound both the same is I can only assume through a story that's going to develop down the road that Latomi is a small little name that all that the Latome Kingdom or Lat Kingdom is linked to all these locations by its primary name, Lat or Latome. And every other location under it, where it's a village or a miniature city, has association with that name. That's all I could say with regards to that. I could be off. But we get to meet uh, Okta here and we get to meet um, Vela Vera here. And one's a vice captain and one is a captain, and they are responsible for watch guard service with regards to citizens coming into the into the, the location, and with regards to travelers and hunters coming into location. There are a lot of rowdy people, but they play a significant part with regards to this enemy. And I believe by the sixth episode, that's when I came. No, no, by the fourth, fourth or fifth episode. Um, was it the fourth or fifth? I'll have to go back. By the fourth or fifth episode, it could be the sixth. Um, we get to see her going into Latome, and she bought certain things, and she eventually tries to buy a tent. She doesn't have money for a tent. Okta tells her he knows a place he could get a tent. Grabs her by the arm. Valavera has to tell him to be calm and be cautious. You know, she's just a little uh, boy. Um, he doesn't know that he's a, she's a boy. No one knows that, um, uh, I mean, he, uh, Valavera and Okta doesn't know that uh, uh, Ivy is actually a girl. They all think that um, Ivy is a boy. So they treat her as such. Um, so yeah, and that's where this comes, anime comes to an end. In all truth, I don't know where the direction of this anime will go, but I know where the direction of this anime will go much more than I do for Gekinkai, um, for the Gekinkai anime. I know uh, it's possible that the future of the anime lies directly within how the world is fleshed out more with regards to a lot of me and with regards to motivations by certain characters not association with Ivy. And if this is going in the direction I think it's going, that is fleshing out this world like a, like water drops. Like if you drop a pebble in the water and it ripples outwards, and slowly but surely every ripple represents a step outwards going towards the bigger picture or the bigger locations, then this is very good. And it will have a long lasting life. And if she's a good tamer, she'll eventually learn 
skills and abilities and associated with certain beasts that are able to protect her and things that she will be able to learn from in order to eventually become a ruler or eventually escape this world and go into the world where the stranger, the visual stranger, that the savior um, comes from. Or eventually you will learn that maybe the reason why she has no stars is because she really isn't good. That she really is the bad guy of the story through this character, this mysterious character. But we don't know this because the story is slowly fleshing this stuff out, which is very good. We're introduced to many things and many people down the road and many creatures, which I like had no idea this world would have ogres in it. I thought it would be a different type of magic um, magic show. But if ogres are in here, then that means trolls are in here. And if trolls are in here, that means, um, uh, what else? I would say vampires are in here. And if vampires, no. Vampires and werewolves can't be in here. Vampires and werewolves are associated with Victorian style lore. This is something way before. This is more like an association to Arthur type fantasy, not a century or two after. So, ogres, trolls, warlocks, witches, dragons, wyrms, three headed beasts, two headed beasts golems, anything that goes back to medieval period, I would say would be present in this anime and be very relevant, as well as you know, Titans are more ancient. So I don't know exactly how the beasts are going to be present, uh, more beasts are going to be presented here, but it's going in the right direction. Things are fleshing out accurately, things are being presented accurately. The main character is very is more interesting than um, you know uh, Origasa from uh, Gekin, and to me she's also more interested than um, Higan of um, Ninja Kamui. So this character is far more interesting than Higan, even though Higan has far more interesting destiny than it seems that she has. So moving on from that. We we'll get to our next anime. Speaking of Higan, this is Ninja Kamui, and Ninja Kamui is not as complicated as you would think. The anime tries to <laughs> tries to seem that it's more complicated than it is, but it really isn't. And this is one of the things I find very fascinating that people is uh, they are attaching themselves to this anime as if this is one of the greatest animes that ever to be released in the past uh, two two or three years. That's not the case. How the anime is executed is done well. The intro anime of the guy on the subway train, to him running in the in the corner or, or running through the streets and in an alleyway, to him fighting ninjas and being eventually killed off by ninjas, um, the boss ninja, to him uh, t to that scene then transitioning to uh, a guy on the farm, to that situation then showing the guy on the farm with his family. Uh, with his uh, son and his wife and having a good old time to that then showing the scene of them seeing this stuff on television realizing that it's in association to who they are as a mother and a father and the son doesn't know anything about it um, gets presented here within the first um, 10 to 20 minutes of the anime first 10 minutes um, which is kind of good what isn't good is the fact that it's happened two times already and throughout the process of the anime before the first episode is over it's literally happened three to four times and they're still on the farm so an anime that makes that big of a hiccup is either intentional is intentionally done or it's not intentionally done and the people who made the anime don't know what the hell they're doing um, because you can't give exposition, you can't give part of the story without knowing that people are going to question it in that way. So I have to say it was intentionally done for him to remain on that farm with his wife, which would make him kind of an evil person. Because 
if you know that the threat is going to come soon, why stay in the same place at the same time? Unless you were intending to stay in the same place at the same time because you want to be free from your wife and your kids. But this is a revenge story. If he intended to do so, why take revenge if you intended to do so? It's very strange that the director would go this route or the creator of the anime would go this route not assuming that someone would actually question it but it seems too clean and neat for it to be that obvious that he would remain there that means something else is going on something within the story as presented that was intended to happen which is a bad way of doing it you're making the character stupid if it was intended so that being a bad thing we're moving on to the good things and this is one of the good things um, in the development of the story of Ninja Combo, you have these power lines, but these aren't regular power lines. These are futuristic power lines, and they're they're represented by tech. It's like huge, giant computer towers, uh, not just regular power lines. And they understand what's going on within the area of this world. So it's like the it's like the anime is revealing certain things to you simply through certain objects. Because normally, why would they have something like this? It's more effective to have something that of a power line that looks like this. No. And the fact that it has a computerized elements to it seems to play out that it's more than just what it is. Now, I could be wrong, and it's not power lines, and it's something associated with livestock or with agriculture. Agriculture. And it has nothing to do with power lines. But it comes across as such. Eventually it will play out as a company called Aizu. Has the eyes and the ears and you know the hands and everything. That's why at the beginning of this anime. It seems to me that that is the case that's happening here. At the very beginning. So that's why it's good. The reveal of certain things on the low is present here as well as a good intro to the beginning of the story, just not a great one. In some ways, you could say that was kind of a cliche intro with regards to a guy running from bad guys to eventually get killed by bad guys and then they show up on the screen. That's true. But how it's shown, how it's cut is good. What's, but it's normal. It's not great. So at the start of this anime, it's nothing to write to home, write home to mom about. In fact, I would say it's poor with regards to Tamer and with regards to, uh, well, it's a little better than Gekin, um, but it's not better than Tamer. Um, but that said, by the fourth um, news broadcast, third or fourth news broadcast, news broadcast, they're still on the farm. He's basically responsible for them dying. And in the process of them being dead, he goes on to take his revenge against the ninjas by killing a lot of them and eventually gets killed by himself. So Higan ends up waking up in the morgue after being stabbed in the back, straight through the spine. He's legally dead. Um, so the anime does not explain how someone got stuck from the back to the front by a sword through the spine, shattering the spine, and how he could wake up sitting up as if nothing ever happened. So his body internally repaired himself. Now that's where the intrigue of the story starts. Not from him being on the farm, not from the news, not from the guy being killed at the beginning, or the showing of ninjas in this world, but from the fact that he woke up from the dead. But he's not a zombie. We get to learn through the story that he has specific ninjutsu skills and that he's an assassin, or he used to be an assassin. And we learn of this when he pulls a wire out straight from inside of his wrist and then stuck said wire from his wrist into, from his wrist here, directly, directly under his wrist, through his wrist, pull it out, and then he stuck that metal rod or that metal wire into his shoulders. So he took it out of his hands and then stuck it into his shoulders. And by doing so, it's kind of he releasing himself from being restrained. So the wire or the rod in his hand was to keeping his hand from restraining from 
doing things that he didn't want to do, but stuck it into his shoulder, allow him to basically allow his hand to be free and to let loose. So he used a specific type of ninjutsu that the other ninjas don't know about. A secret art, a secret technique taught to him by his old masters. Now it's discovered through this anime that the leader of this ninja clan um, is someone in the shadows. Uh, I think his name is Yagami or Yami. Um, and he wants to learn about this secret technique that Higan has. Which is strange to me because Higan used to be part of their ninja group. So if anyone knew about the secret skills, it's the person that taught him it. But apparently Higan didn't learn forbidden ninjutsu from their clan. He learned it from someone else or from reading something else that he found. And whatever forbidden ninjutsu he found was the ability to revive himself from being dead. Now, in this anime, what is present is two factors. One is ancient ninjutsu art, and two is technology. Technology run by Aizu. So we're very much in a ghost in the shell world where the advances of technology can help you to recover from serious injuries, but not to the level of being stabbed through the back and getting your spine destroyed and then coming back to life. That's, not, that's something that would cause you to, would cause multiple days, if not weeks, in order to recover from regardless of how miraculous your medicine was or your curing formula was, or tech in association, in association to curing formula was. So whatever this ninja skill is, it advanced whatever tech he has in his body in order to repair it, that it could repair spine in a matter of hours or just a day, because he was legally presented to be dead in a day, and the very next day he woke up in the morgue. So maybe he has a cooldown time of one day total, but still, that's phenomenal. Whatever his ninja skills, ancient forbidden art is, is something that the very the leader of this ninja clan really wants. And then this guy, who is the main antagonist of this story, um, is not really the main antagonist of this story. He's not really the main antagonist of this story. He comes across as it, but if it's it's clearly it's clearly evident that he's not. Um, Aizu, the international tech company, um, and that's putting it lightly because they have a hand in everything. They're pharmaceutical companies. They're you know agricultural companies. They're they're um, I don't know. They're VR companies, gaming companies. They're they are everything. Basically, if Umbrella from Resident Evil had their hand in everything you could possibly think of, they would be the Umbrella of that world, or of this world. Umbrella only has this hand in things that are useful to Umbrella. VR games, not really, not really useful to Umbrella. Um, agricultural, not really useful to Umbrella. Things that regular household activities, stoves, um, things in tech aren't really useful to umbrella unless they're biological or technological necessary for them to achieve an ends physically. Whereas this anime have a tech company that has its hand in everything from your cooking equipment to, to the damn, I don't know, to the damn games you play. Um, to military operations, to even hiring ninjas in bodily recovery uh, and pharmaceutical products, as well as probably a lot of illegal things as well. So this is very much a big boy company that has to be taken down. So it's not just about Higan getting his revenge against his boss here. And I could only assume that's what's going on because this is Higan when he was a boy. And his wife died in a very his wife died in a very similar fashion to how his mother, I'm assuming this is his mother, died. And his father, which is him, died. 
and the anime shows that he's alive or he was kept alive are allowed to stay alive and probably kidnapped by the same organization that raised him as a ninja after his parents got killed. What is strange to me is that his son, in his existence, died along with his wife, whereas when he was a boy, he was just taken. Which brings up the factor of the interest of this anime even more. Um, why it would be considered in my second slot, if not my third slot, that's why I have it in the third slot. Is the sun really dead, or is it just a ruse? Clearly, I saw the sword in the wife's neck. I guarantee she is dead. But the sun was shown dead along with her. But he was facing away from her, the same way he gone as a boy is facing away from the mother. But he's alive, but his son was dead in his situation, which could be foreshadowing that the son is not dead. But who knows? Perhaps that's what's going on. And if that's what's going on, then why show the scene? I mean, I guess it's not the same, but it's all about story distribution and story uh, development. If you're going to show something like this, you it's understandable that people would look to what happened with his wife and son to see that there's possibly something going on there. Or this could be what you call a distraction to make you think that way. So either way, moving forward, and I don't assume, I think the son is actually dead, to be honest with you. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's alive. It would be kind of a cliche to see if he was alive, to be honest with you. It's like, oh, I've seen that before. That's been done before. Why do it? And if they are going to do it, and the son is very much alive, you have to be doing it. You have to do it in a way that is great. If it's done in a stupid way, it's going to fall flat, which means this anime is not going to live much long. Um, it's going to be a one-shot anime. It's going to live to probably about a couple of season two most, and then boom, it ends. But if, it's, if that's not the case, if there's a bigger picture that goes beyond his son, then the longevity of this anime is will go beyond just revenge because eventually it has to go beyond just revenge. But if the story is simply to, for him to get his revenge and this is a one-shot, then it succeeded. But why create an anime for that simple purpose? Maybe certain pleasures are meant to just be one thing and then end. If that's the route that they're going, then that's too, that's good. But at the same time, that's not very good. So even though I have it up here within my top three for January, February, it's in my third spot because it feels like it's not going to last long. Um, but that all depends on, I guess, the popularity of the anime, which is very popular right now, to... The destination of the story if the story falls flat then it will fail there are many things in this anime that are already failing in my mind but it's also many things that's in this anime that's done quite right for instance this guy is strung up the guy who ass he kicks that killed his wife he doesn't just um, hung this guy up stuck him in a couple of times and eventually after recovering the next day with his friend healing his body um, goes back to the same guy and you know what happened thereafter. The damn, uh, you know, the match is a representation of what happens to that guy. Um, so moving on from that, our, we get a character introduction um, way before the scene. Uh, two FBI agents met him while he was in the hospital, right after his wife died. One is a man and the other is a woman. Uh, the man name is Mike Morris, FBI agent. The woman name is Emma. Emma something, um, don't remember. But Mike Morris is easy to remember. First M starts with first letter. Second M starts with last letter. Uh, yeah, Mike Morris. And Mike Morris goes back to his uh, head of uh, his uh, FBI department. They tell him to drop the case. Don't look into it. Turns out the FBI is on payroll, or at least meant to keep quiet for whoever is in charge of the FBI and the higher ups to keep it quiet because they're on the payroll. If the FBI if the FBI are not on payroll, 
then the person in charge of managing things for the FBI is on payroll. So that said, he's meant to keep it quiet and to mind his own business, not not to stuck, uh, not to stick his uh, nose into where it doesn't belong. We got to see his uh, partner Emma here going into virtual reality to find out where certain criminals are, and by playing certain games, he learns. Uh, Mike Morris learns that um, through Emma that a lot of criminals are now using VR in order to do illegal activities. And even though she's actually having fun playing the game, um, she's also claiming that she's looking for them at the same time. And it's strange how this tech company called Aizu started off with um, virtual reality simulations and virtual reality games. And now they're into pharmaceuticals and as well as military operations and military tech and um, a software, uh, software all around the world. It's not just Japan, but they're everywhere. So it's very strange how something as simple as virtual reality gaming turn out to be something like this. I guess this is a warning to those who are into virtual reality of anything or dependency of virtual reality of anything that if you depend solely on tech all the time, it will eventually become a hindrance more than um, a benefit. Though I don't see it that way if you're manually managing it. If you allow it to get out of uh, your control, then it's time to pull the plug. Um, a good example of this would be uh, Total Recall or Arnold Schwarzenegger. He made a duplicate of himself using tech of a VR image. Um, doing that, you couldn't tell the difference between Quaid and within, within with Quaid and with the with his VR image. So you have Jack Quaid or Quaid himself saying, "Hey, how you doing?" Enemy shooting at the you know hologram or illusion or the VR simulation of himself. Well, Quay was standing right right behind him and shot him all up. So that's how that is. That's present here. Uh, eventually, it will get to that level here. But it's present here with regards to Hegan, how he how he could use tech in order to help him move forward. I mean, it's not stated that that's what it is, but it's stated that he's using uh, forbidden arts or, or or ancient arts in order to heal his body. But through the existence of Aizu and tech of Aizu. We get to learn at, at once Mixer Mike Morris meets Hegon, Hegon in secrecy, tried to arrest him. A bunch of delivery guys keep popping up over and over, which adds a sense of bravado and hilarity to the anime, which is very good for the story as well. Turns out thereafter, uh, he's attacked by one of the so called delivery guys, and it's a ninja. But the ninja is carrying hardware associated with that of Aizu. So that's how Aizu was first introduced into this old situation when they found out that the ninja have been killing off all the rogue ninjas or uh, expel or, or exile ninjas or those who just decided to defect or whatever it is that not that's not part of the standard ninja corps anymore. Um, those who aren't agree with the ways of the ninja in current situations were a traditional, so to speak, like Higan are, is they don't want foreigners to know that their secrets and the fact that he defected is because this prick here, um, the major boss of the ninja clan, decided to share those secrets with foreigners. Um, it's a standard theme throughout a Japanese history <laughs> in many of the animes and shows. Um, so Higan is seen as the hero of this anime simply because he doesn't believe in sharing one's tradition in ways with those who don't deserve to know those tradition in ways because they won't know how to use it properly or if they do know how to use it properly they will use it for their benefits and not for the benefit of the society of culture certain things need to be kept home while other things need to be distributed i fully believe that fully believe in this when it comes to anything, you wouldn't share all your secrets with with your uh, with your allies or your enemies, or even half of it, um, because if if they're asking for specifics with regards to things that are necessary for your survival, giving certain information to those people it might be a hindrance rather than a benefit. So. This little situation that's happening here in this anime is very much like the situation that's happening in Geken Kai or uh, Meiji Geken 1874. Uh, motion war logic. Foreigners coming in, foreigners demanding stuff, 
in order for you to play nice with them you give them certain things eventually they'll want more and won't start war with you this is what um Higan believes will happen to the ninja clan that he's devoted himself to and the secrets of their ninja world eventually all that stuff will come out in the open and it's no good for them not no good for their operations no good for their secrecy the ninja clan that he's part of is very much like the secret service the cia you know it's a very much like a james bond thing why would you show all their agents information or give their secrecy to those because you want to play nice with it's not a good idea there's a reason why they're in the shadows doing so seems to be something that this guy is up to and if my assumption is clear that he's playing a bigger game here then it's possible that his anime has nothing to do with ninjas and defecting of ninjas and killing those who have defect or keeping the honor of the ninja clan going i believe this guy's main objective is far greater than just ninja or the ways of ninja I believe he wants to be a ruling body with regards to Aizu themselves. I'm pretty sure he understands that the leader of Aizu is not the real guy that's in charge. And if a, he is the real guy that's in charge, he wants to be in charge of Aizu. And if that's not the objective, and he's simply a cog in a cogwheel, then he's playing an outdated profession but he's not playing by the rules of his outdated profession, which is sharing your secrets to your enemies. So he wants to adapt with regards to change in order to get more power, but he's unwilling to accept the traditions in order to keep things the way they are. He wants to follow the ninja code, but he doesn't really want to follow the ninja code. So I get to see a lot of similarities with regards to history itself played out in this anime and that's present and that's very good and that's another reason why it's in my third slot as pretty damn good anime that came out um, early um, in the winter of this year winter spring it's not really spring yet but winter of this year January February and then we get to meet our last character of episode 3 if I'm not mistaken um, this guy is called the Reaper. He basically threw a sword into a guy or made his sword disappear and go into a guy's stomach. And the guy died. The guy did a wing technique, fast blade. By the time he put sheet himself, uh, sheet his blade back in, um, he was already dead. Um, so yeah, he's called the Reaper for a reason because no person he's ever fought, no matter how skilled they are, has ever not died. So, our big boss here doesn't want the Reaper and Hegon to fight each other. And there's reason for that. There's context behind that. And I could only assume is that either these people, both of them met before in the past, or they're related, or they hate each other, or if they both meet, they'll both kill each other. That seems to be the most logical choice in the situation. That if the Reaper is that good, he might kill Hegon. And he needs Hegon to reveal his secrets to him. Or Hegon will kill the Reaper and he will lose something precious in the Reaper's death. Which can only mean one or two things. The Reaper and Hegon are related or this guy the boss and the reaper are related or none of them are related but he would lose on both counts on both sides if they were to fight if they were to fight each other they would both come out devastatingly injured or they would both come out dead and he would gain nothing from one side dying or the other side dying he would lose in both cases so that said, that was one of the last characters present within the third episode of this anime. Moving forward from that, 
Mr. Mike Morris started to put things together that Isaac was responsible. And he then starts to get into this whole thing about weapons made by Aizu and it's a miracle and where they used to be and where they are now. And then his partner, Emma, started to explain that how these guys aren't just in pharmaceuticals or military stuff. They're in everything. They're in, even in the technology used in order to see certain diseases or to take care of reproduction of the body and in surgery as well as well as home care as well as in financing and as well as in things you wouldn't think that they are in such as architecture or such as um real estate they're in everything and it's scary to that level scary that they're in everything and what's even scarier she then explains that this these people aizu has an entire city that was built that's totally Aizu. Everything in the city is Aizu. Every building in the city is Aizu. And they're all linked together like one huge computer board. And it's all Aizu related. It's an experimental city from what she said. And the only thing I could get out of this anime for the reason why it's stated to be an experimental city is that it's meant to be a testing ground for something devastating to happen. Either a nuclear strike or a battle royale simulation location or a trap made for someone or the last line of defense or a utopia because everything outside of this city won't exist anymore. So it's hard for me to see anyone even infiltrating this place without this place knowing they exist. Like, I believe all these buildings could be possibly towers for tracking people. Kind of like Payne did in the Naruto series when... Um, uh, oh, Jiraiya, yes. When Jiraiya entered the Rain Village. So that could be what's going on here, but to an extreme level. So with that said... I would claim that uh, I would say that this will be the end of this anime. I've went on for quite some time. Um, all three episodes have been identified. All three episodes have been counted for. And the worst part about this anime would be the fact that certain obvious things were presented. So that said, I'm ending it right here. This is me, my final count with regards to this. Um, it's not that great, but it's good at the same time. And I'm ending it off right here. Yes. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll I'll take it. Yeah, this. I'm just doing the video. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's it. I'm checking out. Um, certain people are, are arriving now, so I'm going to finish this up. And that's it. That's all I got to say. Because this, this is on my third list because it's not that great, and because uh, the whole exposition and thing is kind of obvious, and also because for the life of me. Why they decide to all get inside of that car, that little buggy, to explain the whole existence of Aizu. All three of them, Emma, Hegan, Mike Morris, all present inside that vehicle in one area. It's like they're asking for a nuclear strike or someone to kill them off in one shot. All right, so that's it. All three of these enemies are good, um, except for maybe uh, Ninja Kamui, which is good at the same time not so good but tamer and uh major geken uh, 1874 um are very good to me um if you don't consider major geken 1874 to be good i would say switch it around tamer is obviously going to be the winner and if you switch it around even more then ninja kama would be in second place and then geken kai would be in the third place. But make no mistake, I only picked the first one as my first simply because there is more going on from many different locations. In truth, Tamer is the number one in my opinion. And moving forward from that, I would put Gekenkai Isa as the two or Ninja Kamui as the two and Gekenkai as the third. But they're all very good and it all depends on how they flesh out the characters of Meiji Gekken, 1874.
if they don't do anything with the guy um, um, Urigasa, uh, it will fall short. But the overall story is not about him anyway, even though he's the protagonist. I knew that from the beginning. So yeah, that's it for um, January, February anime of 2024. You can watch this in March. All are very interesting, and if you don't find one or two of them interesting, at least one out of these three would be interesting. If you like more blood and guts, I would go the Kamui route. But if you want something more because of fantasy and exploration route, I would go the Tamer route. And if you want something with regards to character development, I'll also go Tamer route more. But if you want something that's more historical and a story that doesn't really have, has a protagonist but doesn't really center around them, center around events, I would go Meiji Gekken, 1874. To me, all are very good and all are very distinct and different. Meiji Gekken is not meant to be a spectacle or meant to improve or to make something vastly great from the point of view of a character. So that's a story story. More character stories are more in Tamer and more in Ninja Kamui. So that's it for this one. I'm calling it a day and you can watch these animes in March. There's at least five, six, or three, four, or five, at least, yeah. At least they have, I, I believe, uh, Ninja Comedy is up to four episodes now. So from, you got a good four episodes in that streaming right now on streaming services. So if you do have streaming services, I would suggest checking each one of those out. They're all very good in my mind. And even if two out of the three fall off, one of them would definitely be successful in the long run. And the last, I believe Tamer might be that one, but who knows? Could be Ninja Comedy. All right, that's it.